your way back to your seat. Welcome to Southern Lakes Church. We have a lot happening here at Southern Lakes Church. We just want to let you know about a few of those things that are happening. Um, one of those is a women's event coming up in just a few weeks here. Relax and unwind. Friday, May 20th, 6.30 to 8.30. This is a wonderful women's event, wonderful opportunity to do exactly as the slide says. Join other women in just having fun activities um, together to build relationships, to just spend some time relaxing and winding and, uh, and joining fellowship with one another. So please, women, you can register online, get all the information details on our website. Hey, also want to let you know about our All Church Serve Day happening on Saturday, May 21st. Um, we are so excited about the serve opportunity. I know Bob Nelson... Um, for, for one, as our uh, director of facilities, is super excited about getting the hands and feet of God's church together to be able to serve his church. And so please come out that day. There'll be snacks, there'll be coffee, but also some wonderful opportunities to, to serve and work and, uh, and help just kind of our, our property out and getting it ready for the summer months ahead. I also want to let you know about our baptism coming up. Um, it's going to be coming up in, I believe, early June, but there's an informational meeting on May 15th. After both services, if you are interested in hearing what we um, believe about baptism and have that conversation with uh, Pastor Ken, and if that's the step you'd like to take, step you haven't taken yet in your Christian walk, we'd love you to get more information about that um, on that day. Pastor Ken. Good morning, everyone. 
Hope you're doing well on this May Day. We are actually to the month of May. And uh, if you're a guest with us today, let me say welcome. So glad that you're here. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, I hope I have that opportunity today. And you can help us get connected with you by filling out the communication card. You'll find that in the chair rack right in front of you. Or you can find it online. I have a no-hassle guarantee. If you fill that out, we're not going to hassle you, but it does help us to get connected with you a little bit. And you can drop those in the giving boxes on your way out in the back. Consider that your contribution with us today. Or better yet, you can take it to the Welcome Center, and we have a gift that we'd love to put in your hands, answer any questions you might have about Southern Lakes. So welcome. Glad that you're here. Hope you connect with God and some other people while you're here. Enjoy a great day for sure. Well, next week is Mother's. Mother's Day. A few of you are on the ball. The rest of you that may need that reminder, it's coming quickly. Yes, indeed. And I just want to encourage you. We're going to be honoring mothers in our services next Sunday. This is another one of those wonderful opportunities to just reach out to a friend or a neighbor, a coworker, and invite them out to church. A lot of times people don't come because they haven't been invited. And so this is one of those times. Let them know we're having Mother's Day. So if there's some moms around you, just invite them to come out. We hope to see you and them next week. Uh, I'd also like to rejoice in um, just uh, what happened this past week. On Monday, we had an EFCA um, regional conference. Uh, this happens a couple times a year. This was the spring conference. And I don't talk much about the EFCA, so I just wanted to talk about that a little bit today. It's the Evangelical Free Church of America. Our church is part of an association of about 1,500 churches uh, worldwide. We have a common doctrinal statement, and we, we uh, willingly work together for the sake of the gospel. And uh, we have some wonderful conferences a couple times a year, and we did that this past week. Uh, there were a number of things that uh, were brought out that I just want to share with our church that are uh, points of rejoicing. One of the board members that was going off the board highlighted the fact that in his six-year tenure, just over the past six years, uh, our local uh, regional conference, the Forest Lakes District, has grown from about 100 churches to about 140 churches now that are EFCA churches just in the state of Wisconsin, and there's one in Upper Michigan. Uh, we had a lot of fun with that one, but one in Upper Michigan. So uh, very excited about that. It welcomed five new churches uh, into the Forest Lakes District this past Monday, and there's about 18 church planters right now that are in the pipeline that are looking to plant churches uh, in our area. And I have the pleasure of working with one of them right now. I'm coaching him and uh, his team as they're getting ready to plant uh, here in the state of Wisconsin. And uh, very exciting as we work together for the gospel and the glory of God. You guys don't hear much about that. It's kind of all behind the scenes, but I wanted to just give you that report because we do support the, uh, the FLD, the Forest Lakes District, as well as the, the national. And the main reason for that is because they're doing great things in terms of onboarding churches and reaching new people. And uh, we're just praising God for all of that. So could you just join me in celebrating that? Amen. Our goal is to be a generous church. Uh, we, we believe we can't outgive God, and we just want to keep upping our generosity and, and giving to great causes that are, you know, putting the gospel forth. And uh, another one of those great opportunities is you give, and please continue to give faithfully, is going to be uh, into compassion and making a difference with some kids around the world. So check out this video. <laughs> The day my mother found out she was pregnant, my father told her to end the pregnancy or he would leave her. She chose me. He was gone before I took my first breath. As a single, uneducated mother in Villa Flores, Mama struggled every day to provide for us. As a young girl, I would think about my future. Would I ever become someone? The voices of my neighborhood said, you're just a poor child. Your future is set. You will never become anything. I needed someone to change my future. I joined the Compassion Program at my church.
Then, one day, I shared my dream with my sponsor. My sponsor's reply was simple. Yanelli, I love you, and I believe in you. Sometimes you can't believe in a dream until someone else believes it with you. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. My name is Yanelli Suero, doctor, wife, mother, and a precious daughter of God. Right now, there are millions of children all over the world who are desperate for someone to believe in their future, just like I was. On this Compassion Sunday, you can tell a child in poverty you believe in their future. Sponsor a child today. Well, good morning. My name is Matt, and uh, Compassion Sunday is one of my favorite Sundays. I, I love the organization, and I love the opportunity to share it with you all and having you step by the table and look at the kids and um, hearing stories of people that have sponsored kids. It just it's a, it's a great pleasure and a blessing. So I, I love it. But maybe some of you, you know, because we've been doing this for a long time here at Southern Lakes. So a lot of you probably have kids that you're sponsoring through Compassion. Um, maybe they're getting older and close to maybe getting out of the program. Um, maybe you're looking for maybe getting another kid that you could sponsor through Compassion. Or maybe you've heard about this, we've talked about this a number of times, and maybe this might be the year that you decide to, to check somebody out and, and sponsor one of the kids. But it's a, it's a huge blessing. Um, I love Compassion for a number of reasons. You know, but in addition to just the fact that they come in and they help with uh, medical care, dental, they, they provide meals, um, it's connected through a local church which is different than a lot of other organizations that it's just simply a, you know, a handout or, or helping people in poverty. This is, this is really helping train kids to see their, their individual importance in the, lie, in the eyes of Jesus. You know, that they're special. It doesn't matter about their economic status, but um, that God loves them individually. And that's what I think was really, really powerful about compassion. And, and for you, it can be a huge blessing, too. And we've enjoyed over the years, we've sponsored Antony now. He's 17, so he's close to leaving the program. But we've written letters back and forth to him, which is a, it's just such a huge blessing to get those letters back and see how they're doing, learn about their family. We sponsored someone from Honduras, so when we go down and visit Camp Cali, we're actually able to go to see the family. So we've visited the family a number of times. And I remember the first time I walked up and saw the house that they live in and the, the dirt floor and the spaces between the boards and the sides of the house. I thought, wow, this is, this is real poverty. But family that loves Jesus and has just been a huge blessing to get to know them. Um, so if, if you're interested, we've got a table out back. We'd love to answer your questions. I've got, um, I've got Sophia here. Sophia was born in 2018, but she's been in the program waiting for a sponsor for 167 days. Um, so, you know, she's super cute, but you'd have to come see her yourself at the table to see how cute she is. Um, but maybe this would be someone you could think about sponsoring, but I'd be glad to answer any questions you've got about compassion. Um, it'd be a great, uh, great to share that with you. So I'm just going to continue the service and, and pray for that. Heavenly Father, just thank you so much for your blessings. Um, thank you that we live in a country that um, we just have so many resources. And I pray that whether it's compassion whether it's uh, widows, whether it's neighbors, um, that you just give us a heart of generosity, that we would take the many blessings that you've given us and that we would have open hands, that we wouldn't hold it close to ourselves, but that we would share it with others. And in doing so, just share the love of Christ. I pray that you just um, bless compassion in their ministry and, and bless the kids that we have on the table out back. I pray that they would find sponsors and that 
you would use their being a part of compassion as a way to help their whole family, just to see the love of Jesus and the, the generosity of others, that you would continue to build your kingdom through meeting real needs of people. I pray for the rest of our service. I thank you for the, the time we have here to, to worship you and to hear from your word. I pray to be with Pastor Ken this morning and he would share what you would have for us to hear and that we would have hearts to listen. I pray that you just, um, just again, we just thank you that you're with us and pray you help us to worship you this morning. Thank you again for blessing us. Thank you for loving us. And um, we just love you back and, and just thank you for the opportunity we have here to be with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, you can stand and join us. Um, and as you, as you do, I just... Uh, I want to share with you just, just a moment here. We're introducing, sort of introducing, we've introduced it at Exalt, for those who were able to be a part of that. Uh, you heard this, but the song called King of Love, and, and the song in the second verse says, let compassion be the loudest song we sing. And the song is called King of Love because we serve a king who, who really, above all else, showed us love in a tangible, real way that's, that's truly supernatural and unconditional. I know for all of us here, we've all experienced relationships in our lives that are conditional relationships. You know, I'll love you, but you gotta do this, 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 this. You know, I'll be kind to you, but first you have to do these things. And we, we face people in our world all the time like that. But God has called us to, to a higher calling, a calling like himself that says, I'm going to be compassionate to the least of these. I'm going to love even when others don't. I'm going to be Christ to others in my life. So I encourage you as we learn this song together and remember the King of love, our Savior Jesus Christ, remember also the calling he's placed on our lives to be people of love. Let's sing together.
song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. the birds chirping in the morning, the rain, and everybody who is here today in your house. I pray that 
that we will trust you, God, and leave all the consequences to you because you never overlook obedience. Faith is built by prayer with expectation. You have given us your Son who lives in us. Help us to claim this by the way we live. Please, have us be obedient to your word, especially the word that is going to be preached by Pastor Ken, James 1, 20 through 25. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Let me invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of James as we continue our series there today. We've been working our way through the book little by little. We're actually going to finish up chapter one today, so we're making progress. Uh, some of the other chapters will go a little quicker. Uh, chapter one was certainly foundational in all that was going on. Let me start out with uh, some startling statistics that will hopefully just get you thinking with me this morning. LifeWay Research that does a lot of these kinds of things, uh, just at the end of last year, December, uh, came out with these stats. Those who self-identify as Christians in the U.S. right now is at about 63% of all the people. And to put that into perspective, it's dropped 15% over the last 15 years. Ouch. A precipitous fall, if you would. And if you were to look at it, it's, it's happened little by little, sequentially. On the flip side of that is those who self-identify as the nuns. Those would be the atheists, the agnostics, those who say they don't have any religion, uh, any belief in God at all, per se. And that has almost been a mirror image since 2007. It's gone up 15 percentage points. And so you can see kind of the inverse uh, proportion that's happening in our country right now. So take that, but then think with me about those who self-identify as Christians, because here's the real kicker. Less than half of those pray daily. About 25% of those attend church weekly. Okay, so translate that. 75% of so-called Christians are not in church today on a regular basis. They just aren't there. About 10% read the Bible on a daily basis. Now, I don't want to make too much out of this, but what I do want us to think about is the fact that many times, if you were to drill down a little bit, the, the lifestyles between those who are professing Christians and those who are not, sometimes is not all that different. Uh, the divorce rate is still uh, very high. Uh, that, that is happening uh, in their lives. Uh, sex outside of marriage, their views on that, their practices uh, on that, uh, various sins in their lives, drunkenness, and uh, alternate lifestyles, and coming down where God does in his word, of, in his word on, on many of these issues. There's, there's like no difference, which begs the question, Why? Now, there are probably a lot of reasons to that we could talk about today, but I think James really brings us face-to-face -face with one of the really important reasons why here in chapter 1. Why is it that so-called Christians aren't all that different from those who are non-Christians? Uh, why is it that uh, our young people are leaving the church in record numbers and not sticking around. James has something to say about that. James has something to, uh, as it were, maybe a word of warning to each of us today so we don't become part of that sad statistical side of things. Here's what he says, beginning in verse 21 down through the end of the chapter. Therefore, lay aside all wickedness and overflow, all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. 
For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. And he looks into the perfect, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Now, the world that James was writing to wasn't all that different than our world today. A.D. 45, we believe that James was one of the earliest books written in the New Testament. Uh, The Christians at that point were scattered abroad. He was writing to them. But many of them are like so-called Christians today where the word of God was in one ear and out the other. Say that with me. In one ear, out the other. You all know what that's like, right? We talked about selective hearing last Sunday. And if we're not careful, that's what happens with God's words, God's instructions to us. It can be in one ear, out the other. It makes no difference whatsoever. And so what James contrasts in this passage is two different people or kinds of people. We know there's a continuum here. But it's those who hear the word only. They don't do anything with it. And those who hear the word but are doers also. We're going to look at three characteristics of each one of those. So first of all, those who are hearers only. The first characteristic of those who hear only is that they are perpetually immature. They're perpetually immature. Remember what James is writing for here. Again, the theme of the book is be mature. He wants us to grow up in Jesus. He wants us to become more like the Son of God in our lives. How does that happen? Well, it happens through a process of putting off the old man and putting on the new man, which was created in righteousness in Christ Jesus. And so the way he says it here, he says, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. That's what we have to do. We have to lay it aside, not just part of it, not just the things that we think we can do without, but we have to lay aside all of the filthiness, all of the sin, if you would. We often don't think of sin that way, but it's filthiness. It's an affront to a holy God. And we have to lay all that aside And what do we do instead? We receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So we lay aside the sin, the overflow of wickedness, and we receive what God has for us. That's how we grow. Uh, That word meekness there uh, identifies the attitude of of a learner, of a grower, somebody who humbles themselves and says, God, I need you. And what we need is the implanted word. It's the word of God that comes into our lives. And it's, it's planted in us as we receive Christ. And then it saves our souls. Now, you have to think about salvation as a deliverance. But it's deliverance past, present, and future. Uh, we're delivered from the actual penalty of sin when we come and receive Jesus as our Savior. We're delivered from the power of sin in this life here and now. Sin has no power over us. That's why we can lay it aside. And eventually we're going to be delivered from the actual presence of sin. We're in the presence of the Savior in heaven one day. So it's able to save our souls. The Christian life is not about keeping up appearances It's about being like Jesus. That's what it is. It's putting off, putting on, dying to self, acting like Jesus, growing up in him. But the person who hears the word only, if it's in one ear and out the other, they don't grow up. They're perpetually perpetually immature. And I just got to tell you, it's kind of messy, and it's after a while, it's, it's just not pretty. So... These are the kind of photos that make my day, right here. All right, so here's Natalia. She's going to be one the end of the month here. And, uh, and my granddaughter. So she's, she's eating, right? And that, oh, that's so cute. And she's having fun. She's really getting into it, experiencing all the texture, all the flavor, right? And that's wonderful when you're about one years old. 
But at some point, you have to mature, you have to grow up, and, you know, it's not going to be so pretty if you're out on a date later in life, and that's what you do, you know? Or you, you got that big event, you got a big job, you know, a big banquet you go to, and, and that's what you do, you know? It's like, ugh, not so good. There, there comes a time you see in the Christian life where it's not so cute to be messy. When, when you come to Christ, total understanding. We come to him with all of our brokenness and our mess and our sin, and we lay it all down at the foot of the cross, and he comes into our life and he forgives us, but then he begins a process of cleaning us up and putting our feet on a solid rock and and, and helping us to change in our lives. And that messiness begins to get cleaned up. And so if you've known the Lord for a period of time, but you're still in that messy You have to ask yourself, what's going on? And here's what's going on a lot of times. Go back to our statistics. You say, why is this? Why are so many people that are so-called Christians still in this state of messy after so long? In one ear, out the other. They're in this state of perpetual immaturity. The next characteristic is they fail to launch. They fail to launch. Uh, they don't act upon what they've heard. Uh, when I was a tech ed teacher, and I've, I've done that for like 25 years as a, a substitute. My undergrad is in technology education. And uh, one of the, the fun projects we would do often was to build rockets, model rockets. I always loved that. And so I'd give instructions to the kids. They'd do research. They'd build these rockets. And then would come the exciting day, launch day. The day everybody looked forward to and, you know, wait for a good weather day and we got to get outside of the classroom and go out on the field and we got to launch rockets. But one of the things that launch day always revealed was who was listening? Who was following directions? And I usually knew who that was before we even got out there, but then it proved it out. So here's a a picture of of, of a model rocket, and things are a little different now, but there's a certain way to put them together, and if you don't put them together right, you've got problems. And on top of that, uh, the way they used to light them is they just light a fuse and run back, and they take off, but now they've got an electronic ignition system, and so you put an uh, igniter down here in the in the base, in the engine, and you can stand off with the electrodes, and you can just launch it with a button. But if they didn't get that igniter right and didn't follow directions, they could sit back and push that button all day long. Nothing would happen. It failed to launch. That's a picture of a lot of believers today. They failed to launch. God has been trying to light a fuse with them. God's been trying to shoot them off like a rocket and nothing. Nothing. And it's so sad. And, and I got to tell you, this, this whole message just kind of <laughs> grabs my pastor's heart because it, it's like where I live every day. And I've seen so many people with so much potential. It's like, why don't you use it? Uh, this person's going to do great things for God. And then pff, nothing. They failed to launch over and over again. It's so sad. Uh, I, I'll, I'll preach the word of God and and. Every week, I I don't know if you understand this, but every week I put in hours of work. I I get done today, and it's like, that's behind me, and I get ready for the next week, and every week it's like, boy, this message is going to change your life. Man, it's going to be transforming. Woo! It's going to be great. And I get pumped up and all ready to go, and week after week after week, and try to be either way, and it's going to change everything, and then, and, and I don't know. Man looks on the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. I don't don't know what you do with it, but sometimes it seems like, ah, build a launch. You're this great transforming message is going to change your life and (laughs) maybe I'll catch it online. What's meant by the hearer of the word? The hearer of the word here when James wrote is similar but a little different for us because they did not have copies of the scripture. Uh, They didn't own scrolls. So they would go to the synagogue or the house of worship or home or wherever and they would hear the word of God read to them. 
explained to them. They had to listen very carefully. And that was the only way to take it with them. And they were very dependent on this, this verbal process and passing it along that way and repeating stories and scripture. And, and today, we have that, but we have so much more, right? We have a copy of the Bible. It's, just stop and think about that for a little bit. Fascinating. And not only we have a copy, we have it in all kinds of different translations. You can bring it up on your phone. You can parse it. You can study it. You can put it on listen and have any number of different voices and accents and languages that you can listen to the word of God. It's just fascinating all that we have. And so to be a hearer of the word means all those things, all these different inputs, if you would, that we have. And the people back then, just like us, they had exposure to the word of God, this oral tradition, if you would. They were hearers, but they failed to do anything with it. Uh, they were a lot like this foolish builder that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 7. Let's just go back there. This is the story he told, a little bit of a parable. He said, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. Okay, it's not just the hearer, but it's the one who does them. I will liken him to a wise man, built his house on the rock, and the, the rains descended, the, the floods came, the winds blew, beat on the house, and it didn't fall because why? It was founded on the rock. On the flip side of that, though, everyone who hears these sayings of mine, they both heard, and does not do them. I'll liken him to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rains descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on the house, and great was its fall. What's the difference between the fool and the wise in Jesus' story? They both heard, but one acted, one did not. One failed to launch, and the other did not. This past week, we uh, hosted an area EFCA pastors fellowship. We'll do that a few times a year, and, and we skip around to different churches, different ones host it, and so we were able to host it this last week, and a number of pastors came, and it was great. We encourage one another. We pray for one another. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about topics and things, and of course, it was just coming out of Easter, and so one of the big points of praise that everybody was like, hallelujah, you know, after a couple of years, we had kind of Easter back, and a lot of people were back, and our attendance was up, and all the pastors were very excited about that, uh, until one of the pastors brought up the fact that said, until last Sunday, and that would have been a week ago, he said, our attendance was way down. How about you guys? And everybody across the board said, oh, yeah. Went up for Easter, and then very next week it went back down again. And it was a point of discouragement for all the pastors there uh, because of the, some of the things we're talking about today. One of the pastors said, well, I guess Jesus is only alive one day a year. I guess that's it, huh? I said, no, you got that all wrong. He saw his shadow. I think I'm mixing things up there. Anyways, <laughs> what happened? And, and can we bring it a little closer to home? I, I don't do this very often, but we had 415 people here for Easter, which was awesome, okay? Last week, we had 290. 125 people difference from week to week. And it, it went up and it came back down. Now, I'm not here judging anybody. I'm not trying to do that. Uh, hopefully, I'm not scolding you today. It's a fine line between scolding and exhortation, I think. But I, I want to exhort you. I want to I encourage you in this. And, and it just makes me wonder. Uh, I, I know we had some out-of-town guests that came and some people, some we call them priesters that are here just for Christmas and Easter. And, and, and that's great. We're, we're glad they're here and, and all that. But what happens? Jesus is alive! Woo! He, we got power over sin in the grave and hallelujah and fizzle. Failure to launch. That's somebody who in one ear and out the other. Hearers only. Which leads to a third characteristic in a very sad state of affairs, and that is they are self-deceived. 
Verse 22, see, deceiving yourselves. It, it actually gets to the point where they think they're okay. <laughs> Everything's fine. They're, there's nothing really going on there. Verses 23 and 24 paint this picture of somebody who observes themselves and the state of things, but then they immediately forget. It, it's a picture of somebody glancing in the mirror, and then they look away and they forget. Okay, so we have mirrors today that are a little different than they had back then. They had polished bronze and, and silver and gold even, and it would give them a little bit of a distorted view. And then later on, they got the glass-coated mirrors and then the, the ones with the silver on them, the quicksilver. And, and so we got very good mirrors today that we can use. It'd be like this, looking in the mirror. Ooh, scary. Uh, looking in the mirror... And you see something that needs attention but doing nothing about it. Oh, wow, I wish somebody would have told me about all that, that juice that got running down my, my face there, you know, spaghetti. Whew, wow. And then they just set the mirror down and say, oh, well, whatever. Your makeup's running. Your, your lipstick's all over the place. It's like, oh, whatever. And they forget about it. That's the picture of inactivity. The failure to act demonstrates how unimportant what they saw really was. Ah, uh, no big deal. And this picture in the physical realm mirrors the spiritual realm, right? What's going on there? It's inaction rather than the next, the next state, which is action. And this is how many believers are today. Forgetful hearers that leads to self-deception. You look into the law, the, the word of God, and, and God shows you something. The Holy Spirit shows you something, and it's like, eh, no big deal. I'll deal with it later, and you just forget about it. You don't do anything about it. That's that self-deception and failure to launch. So the hearer only... It's perpetually immature. They don't grow up like they should. They fail to launch. They fail to act upon what they're hearing. And that leads to a place of self-deception. Now contrast to the one who does hear and, and is a doer also. First of all, they are studious. Verse 25 talks about this. They look into the perfect law of liberty. That term looks into has the idea that it's a longer look. Uh, they, they continue to look into it. They study it. They become studious. It's like, what's going on here? And they dig in deeper, and they want to understand. And what is it that they're trying to understand? They're trying to understand themselves in light of the perfect law of liberty. The perfect law of liberty, the law is the word of God. Uh, the oral tradition as they had it, and the apostles' teaching uh, back then. It's the word of God, the Bible for us today. It's the perfect law. It is without error, and it brings liberty. It brings freedom. Truth will set you free. That's what it says in John chapter 8. John chapter 8, if you abide in my word, very interesting, not just hear it, but abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It shall make you free. Do you abide in God's word? If you do, it'll lead to the next characteristic, and that is they take action. Verse 25 says, they continue in it. They continue in it. It's, it's this long look in the mirror. It's like, hmm, interesting. What should I do about that? How does that, you know, how can I fix that? What, what does that mean? In comparison to that quick look that forgets with the forgetful hearer that doesn't do anything about it. And this is the critical difference. If you were to compare these two right here, the, the critical difference between them is that the, uh, the doer continues while the hearer forgets. They continue working on it, looking into it. The, the other person just, nah, whatever. They forget quickly. Let me do a little quiz test. How many of you remember what I preached on last week? You don't have to raise your hands. I got to put you on the spot that bad. You'll be tested on the way out today? No. 
I, do you remember what the title was? Do, do you remember what the passage was? Well, I'll give you a little hint. We're preaching out of James. So it was, you know, the two verses right before this, 19 and 20. You know? It was some great advice, by the way. Be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And so we talked about that. Now, hopefully that was very helpful to you and you did something with it. But maybe you don't even remember a week later. Go back two weeks. What did I preach two weeks ago? It's like, oh, oh, that's right. It was Easter, wasn't it? That guy, uh, um, Jesus, he rose from the dead, right? Isn't that what, it, you know? Yeah. But, but what was the message about? What was the message that Sunday? Oh, yeah, it was these two dudes. They're on the road to Emmaus, remember now? Cleopas and his buddy, and, and what happened on the road? You know, eventually they came around, and, and Jesus revealed himself to them, and they became believers and changed their life, and they went and told everybody. And... Now, I'm a preacher, okay. So I'm, I'm realistic. I sat where you sat, and sometimes I do too when I'm not up here. And I realize, even though I want every message to be life-changing and transformative, that's just not going to be the case. That's not realistic. Uh, when I look at preaching, I look at it much like the Word of God. It's a steady diet that I want to have that's going to keep moving you in the right direction of Christ-likeness and challenge you and get you to grow and make you uncomfortable sometimes and, you know, get that whole thing going, give you some new ideas in your Christian life. So I, I realize even though every message I want it to be transformative, it may not be for you. But if you don't take some next steps, you don't do anything with the message, it's in one ear, it's out the other. If you just read the Word of God every day and you don't apply it, it's in one ear and out the other. So we have to personalize the word of God. We, we have to bring it home to us. Do you do that? Uh, when you hear a message, is it like, okay, God, speak to me? Do you prepare your heart, you know, for the word of God? It's like, okay, what can I get out of this message? Even though you may hate it. Maybe you disagreed with something that was said. You, you didn't like the preacher or the style or whatever, but there's something there for you. What is it? God, what, what do you have for me? Where, where do you want me to change? What, what are my next steps in all of this? What do I need to work on? Or is it all about, hey, did you hear that? That was for you. Or you needed that message. Oh, somebody else. Boom, yeah. Preach it, Pastor Ken. Yeah, it's like, what about me? When you read the word and, and you're in the word, is it just for information? Oh, those are interesting stories, and, and that applies to this. And, or is it, okay, God, speak to me. What do I need? And, and then when you hear all of that, what do you do with it? What do you do with it? If you're here, you take it in, but then you take action. You apply it to your life. And the final characteristic is where the rubber really meets the road. When you do that, you become the real deal. Uh, James contrasts the real deal from the imposter, from just religion, if you would, useless religion to that belief system which is useful. Verse 25, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So here are three, uh, pardon me, four aspects of this genuineness, if you would. Genuine Christians, verse 26, bridle their tongue. Now this may not be the only measure of spirituality, but it's a good one. Because Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if somebody's cursing and they got a filthy mouth and it's just terrible stuff coming out and they're disregarding God in their speech and their language and everything, they're not the real deal. They're not. There's an inconsistency. James talks about that. We're going we're to talk about that coming up a little bit more. 
It's a big deal. Uh, Here's another aspect of genuine Christians. They meet the needs of others. Verse 27. Here it talks about meeting the needs of the orphans and the widows. And, And what that represents is the least of these. The people that had greatest needs in their society. Who are those in our society? I I don't know. We could debate some of that. Could be widows and orphans, and it could be those who are are homeless and maybe going through a war and kicked out of their country or any number of things. Who are those people in our society? But here's what happens. Somebody who is genuine says, I'm going to meet those needs. That's true Religion, it's love for every single person. And we're going to help them out. Compassion was a great, great connection with this message today, Matt. Just how are we going to help those that have so much less than us? What a great opportunity. Genuine Christians, number three, keep themselves pure. Verse 27, they they keep themselves unspotted from the world. It's not just about acting like a Christian in a, in a superficial way, but they're going to keep themselves away from the pollution of the world. They realize they got to put their mask on first. They got to take care of themselves and be the real deal before God before they're ever going to be able to help anybody else, much less maintain for the long haul. Be in the world, but not of the world. And number four, genuine Christians are blessed. Uh, it says he is blessed in what he does. And what I always take away from this is like, We are blessed in the doing of the deed. Uh, We're not blessed because we do the deed. That's not why we do it. But as we do the deed for the right reasons, for the glory of God, we're actually blessed in the process of that. I like how Warren Worsby says this in his commentary on James. He says, many people have the mistaken idea that hearing a good sermon or Bible study is what makes them grow and get God's blessing. It is not the hearing, but what? The doing that brings the blessing Too many Christians mark their Bibles, but their Bibles don't mark them. My friends, I want you to be blessed. That's my pastor's heart. I want you to grow. That's my pastor's heart. And where that is, is being the real deal. It is being genuine. And God will use that in amazing ways and bless you in amazing ways as you hear his word and you act upon it and you are genuine in what you do. Now, do you know the difference between religion and all the imposters, if you would, between religion and true Christianity? It's the difference between do versus done. You see, Jesus, when he hung on the cross, said, it is finished. In the Greek, that's a term to telestai, and it means uh, it is paid in full. It was a commercial term that meant that the account has been paid in full. And so as Jesus hung on the cross, he said, your account, your sin account has been paid in full. The wrath of God has been satisfied because Jesus took the penalty for your sin and my sin. That's why he died on the cross. And that's the difference. All the other cults and other Uh, religions out there say, do this, join the church, give money, be this good person, whatever it is, and then you'll get your, your way to heaven. You'll earn your way to heaven. No, true Christianity says it's been done. You can't add anything to what Jesus has already done for you. Did you realize that? And so you just must open your heart and accept the gift of eternal life. Have you done that? Has there been a time when you've received Jesus truly into your life? You see, I think that's part of the problem. A lot of so-called Christians haven't really done that. Oh, they think they have, and so they're self-deceived. Oh, I'm religious. My parents were Christians. But they've never truly repented of their sin and asked the Savior in because they need to be saved from their rotten sin. And when you do that, it changes everything, right? Now you're a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. You begin to grow in Jesus, and you're the real deal. And that's what God wants. That's what God's after. That's what I hope for you, to receive Jesus and walk in him and experience all of his fullness. What does pure religion, undefiled religion look like? Well, it looks like love in action. Love in action. 
we receive God's love, but then we give it out. Jesus said this, John 13, 35, by, by this all will know that you're my disciples, if you have love one for another. And so that may that be a, a mark of you, of this church, that we love like Jesus loved. Love in action, that we're the real deal, because ultimately that's where it ends up. If you are a hearer of the word, you're going to be a doer also, and you're going to be working it out. So I know we're all in different stages of growth. That's okay. That's great. I understand that. There's a continuum, if you would. We've got two broad contrasts here between the hearer only and the doer also, but we're all kind of in between. And there are times we all have selective hearing. So we might hear one message and act upon it and, you know, do great things with it. And other times, like, you know, we turn a deaf ear. We choose not to obey that thing. So I know we're all different places. We're in process. As I say that, we're all people in process. I'm a person in process like you too. So how can we get better at this? Okay? We all need to help on this. How can we get better at this? Let me give you some, some starter suggestions here. Five of them real quick. Uh, read God's word with a view towards application. I think I already spoke to that, but when you open God's word, just, God, speak to me. Maybe take a moment and pray first and say, God, you know, what do you have for me today? And when you get done, park it there for a little bit and ask yourself that question. God, what, what do you want me to do with what I've just read or what I've just heard? Uh, there are lots of ways to do that. Dig deeper into the Sunday messages. Okay, so that's why I give you notes, <laughs> And it takes me a lot of extra time to give you those notes, but uh, you take them home and you study them. I know people save them and they go back over them. That's awesome. Look up the passages. Read it back through for yourself. Discuss it as a couple or a family. Uh, that's, that's a great thing to do with the, with the notes. Uh, you can also unpack it in a group. We have several um, message-based small groups that you can unpack. That's a great way to do it because you learn from each other. And it's a lot of application that comes out in the midst of that, how to take those next steps. By the way, if you're not in a group and you want to get in a group this next uh, summer session, I know some of your groups take a break for the summer, um, and you want to get into a group, I'm inviting you to our group. We're starting a group on May 11th, so not this Wednesday, but the following 11, uh, May 11th on a Wednesday night, 6.30, right here at the church. So if you're not in a group and you want to be in a group and unpack James with us, come on out. Love to have you. So there you go. No excuses. Number three, memorize a key verse from your reading of the sermon. That'll help get it down, remember it, give the Holy Spirit some ammunition. Write down your specific next step. We always leave you space kind of at the bottom or there's always, you know, uh, back of the notes. You can put it there. Where, What's your next step? And then maybe tell somebody for a little bit of accountability. This is what I'm going to do with the sermon today. And then finally, you have to do it, right? Keep walking. Take one step and the next step. And yeah, every, every message, every time you read the Bible isn't going to be totally life transformative. But if you just keep walking and keep taking those steps of obedience and following after, you, you're going to get there. That's what maturity looks like over the long haul. It's a long obedience in your life. So here's the difficulty as I thought about a message like this. The people I'm primarily preaching to are probably more heavily weighted over on this side where they're hearers of the word and doers also. So pat yourself on the back, praise God, keep up the good work. The people that really needed to hear this message probably weren't here. That's just how it always goes. I'm preaching to the choir. But we can all be part of the solution. We can either be part of the problem, go back to the stats that I started with today, things are going in the wrong direction, but we can be part of the solution. What if, what if Southern Lakes Church and the people of Southern Lakes Church were not just hearers of the word, but doers also? What if when we heard messages, we acted upon it and said, let's go do that. Let's get her done. What if when we read the word on a daily basis, like, okay, God, here we go. You and me, we make a majority. Let's, let's have it. What if we followed through on everything that God was showing us? When God said, pray, we prayed. When God said, people are lost and dying without Jesus, we got out there and 
We spread the good news and we are intentional about it. What if when God said, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as is the manner of some, we said, man, I, I'm not going to miss. I'm, I'm going to be there. I, I don't know what God has for me, but something. God, just help me. What if every day we said, God, forgive me for my sins. Help me to become more like Jesus. What if? I think it'd make a difference. Would you pray with me, Father? I pray that you would help us to be people of the word, not in one ear and out the other, but people that would really take a long look, study, act upon that which we hear and understand. Help us to understand. Help us to make correct assessments of ourselves and others in the world around us, but then to show love, to take the love that you've given us and to put it into action, to love the least of these, to make a difference in this world. God, we need you to help us with that. Help us not to just be hearers of the word, but doers also for your honor, for your glory. And all God's people together said, amen. Amen. Thank you. Would you please stand? I will build. God bless you. We'll see you next week.